With more than 10 vaccines in use around the world, everyone wants to know, which COVID vaccine works the best? Today, I'm going to take a hard look at the scientific evidence and give you an answer. Broadly, I will address three questions. How do we measure the effectiveness of a vaccine? How much do virus mutations reduce vaccine effectiveness? And what can go wrong in the future? In the end, you'll have the information you need to make an informed decision. And you'll find the secret behind why some vaccines are more effective than others. If you're new to this channel, this is All Things Public Health, where we take an evidence-based approach to answer important public health questions by reviewing the scientific literature. Let me know in the comments below what topics you want to know more about. So let's get started. Vaccine effectiveness rates are commonly quoted in the media. But where do these numbers come from? Vaccine effectiveness is measured in what's called a phase 3 trial. In a phase 3 trial, participants enroll in the study and are given either a placebo or the vaccine. The participants don't know which one they got and they go about their regular lives. Normally, a phase 3 vaccine trial has tens of thousands of participants. Over time, some of these people will get sick with COVID-19. If more people in the placebo group got sick than the vaccinated group, the vaccine is considered effective. How big the ratio is between the groups determines the effectiveness of the vaccine. What's really important, though, is that these studies need to be published in peer-reviewed journals. Once published, everyone can look at the details of the study, such as the number of participants, their age, sex, where the study was performed, and what time period was covered. This information is really critical to interpreting the results and putting the findings into context. And importantly, this nuanced information cannot be communicated by a pharmaceutical company's press release. We've seen several cases where a pharmaceutical company, notably AstraZeneca, has announced effectiveness numbers and later had to walk back those comments. As of June 1, 2021, only seven vaccines have published phase 3 trial data in a peer reviewed journal. Those are Pfizer. Moderna, Sputnik, Johnson & Johnson, and two from Sinopharm. AstraZeneca is the seventh, but that study is really an outlier. The AstraZeneca study included a lot of irregularities, where they deviated from the protocol, mixed and matched several dosing strategies, and used a sample size that is substantially smaller than the other Phase three studies. So I'm including AstraZeneca in this list, but there is a lot of uncertainty there. The other thing we have to do is define what we mean when we say effective. Effective against what? Most commonly, effectiveness is defined as a vaccine's ability to prevent symptomatic and laboratory-confirmed infection. Each study might measure this in a slightly different way, depending on what they define as symptoms, whether or not they actively test, and how long after the full vaccination they wait. Also, there are other measures of effectiveness, such as preventing hospitalizations, and this is why having the published study data is so important. It allows you to see all of this. For this video, I'll be defining effectiveness as how well a vaccine can prevent symptomatic COVID-19 anytime after 7 to 14 days following the completion of full vaccination. Here's the really interesting part. I pulled together all the phase 3 trial studies, and when you do that, you start to see an interesting trend. But before I get to that, if you're enjoying what you see, be sure to hit that like button. According to the results published in Phase 3 studies, the most effective vaccine at preventing symptomatic COVID infections was Pfizer, which was 95% effective at preventing symptomatic illness. The bars here show the confidence interval, meaning the true measure of effectiveness likely fell somewhere between 90 and 97% for Pfizer. A close second was Moderna at 94%. Then there's Sputnik at 91%. The two Sinopharm vaccines come in at 4th and 5th at 78 and 72% effectiveness. And 6th is Johnson & Johnson at 66.5%. And in last is AstraZeneca with an effectiveness in its December 8th publication of 62% with a wide range of uncertainty, which was due to their small sample size. Let's put this in tabular form. You can see AstraZeneca's small sample size here. The sample in their Phase 3 trial paper was less than 9,000, while all other vaccines use data from 20,000 to 40,000 participants. Another really interesting thing to note is the differences between the study sites. 
Each of these studies took place in different countries and at different times using different populations, meaning different age groups or occupations. One of the things that stands out to me is that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which had the lowest effectiveness, also included many countries, notably Brazil and South Africa, that have seen a widespread outbreak of variants that include key mutations such as E484K, which has been shown to allow the virus to escape existing immunity. On the other hand, Moderna and Pfizer studies were carried out mostly or entirely in the U.S., where these variants were not prevalent. When we dig deeper, we see that the circumstances of the studies may better explain the effectiveness results rather than any real differences in how well the vaccines work. When we compare the vaccine studies, there are two key factors that are different, time and place. Why is this important? Well, the types of virus variants that were circulating in the population at that time were different depending on the time and place. Remember that each vaccine was designed and built based on the original Wuhan variant. In the more than one year of time since the work on these vaccines began, several key mutations have proliferated. Some of these mutations, such as the E484K mutation, have demonstrated the ability to help the virus escape existing immunity. This E484K mutation is found in the so-called South African variant, or B1351, as well as the so-called Brazilian variant, or P1. Recent studies have confirmed that vaccines are less effective against these variants. These studies were able to do this by directly comparing the effectiveness of vaccines against specific variants. One of the most studied vaccines is the one from Pfizer. We'll look at two of these studies. This study from England found that Pfizer's vaccine was 93% effective against the UK variant, or B117, but was only 88% effective against the Indian variant, or B1167. A second study from Qatar compared the UK variant to the South African variant, or B1351. Again, they found a similar trend. Pfizer was 89% effective against the UK variant, but only 75% effective against the South African variant. Compare that to the 94% effectiveness reported in the phase 3 trials. So we have to ask, what form of the virus was present in the U.S. during the time of that phase 3 trial? If we look at genetic sequencing data from that time in the U.S., we see that the clades were 20A, B, C, and G. All of these variants are very similar and can be classified as the D614G variety with pretty meaningless differences between them. What we see is a clear trend of reduced vaccine effectiveness the more the virus has mutated from the original Wuhan form. We also know that individuals have been reinfected and gotten sick with COVID-19 a second time after recovering from a natural infection as a result of being exposed to a new variant. All of this together points to the natural conclusion that as the virus changes, the immune system has more difficulty in identifying and neutralizing it. So if this is true, we would expect that the later the vaccine studies occurred, the less effective a vaccine was. And in fact, when we look at the timing of each study, we see this trend. Here's the time period during which each vaccine was studied plotted next to each other. The earlier the study was completed, the higher the efficacy. Also, the more that the study population included locations where variants of concern were circulating early in places like Brazil and South Africa, again, we see lower vaccine effectiveness. Remember that these variants were only becoming widespread in late 2020. This graph shows the global prevalence of the E484K mutation. The proportion of cases with this mutation grew to 10 or 15% globally by December 2020 and January 2021. Only the Johnson & Johnson study covers that time period. This mutation was also primarily in South America and Southern Africa at that time, locations where J&J &J was collecting data. All the other studies used data from times and locations where variants with key mutations were not circulating. What this means is that the differences in the reported effectiveness between vaccines is probably more a reflection in the differences in the form of the virus it's protecting against rather than real differences in how well the vaccine works. So we see that vaccines are becoming less and less effective as the virus has opportunities to mutate. Why does this matter? There are three key conclusions. First, not all effectiveness data is directly comparable. Just because Pfizer and Moderna had the highest reported effectiveness in their phase three trials doesn't mean they're the best vaccines. 
the high effectiveness of these two vaccines is probably more a reflection of their fortunate situation that they were studied in the U.S. prior to the introduction of any variants that contained immune escape mutations. What we see is that over time, vaccine effectiveness has declined as a result of the virus changing. In fact, many pharmaceutical companies have abandoned phase 3 trials in countries like South Africa or decided to not include data from certain countries in their analyses because the results were not good. Second, until updated vaccines are developed, vaccines are becoming an increasingly less effective tool, especially for countries where widespread outbreaks have yet to occur. Southeast Asian countries like Thailand, Vietnam, and Malaysia are a good example. Currently, These countries are hoping that if they can administer enough vaccines, they will not go through the same situation that Europe and countries in the Americas experienced. But, because such a small proportion of the population in these countries have actually been exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus and developed natural immunity, and because the vaccines are less effective against the strains currently spreading, it means that if you want to build up herd immunity and slow down virus transmission with vaccines, you need to immunize a huge proportion of the population. For an example of how this strategy can fail, look no further than the Seychelles. The Seychelles kept itself isolated from the virus for most of 2020 and then began rapidly vaccinating its population early in 2021. By May, this island archipelago was the most vaccinated country on the planet, with around 70% of the population fully vaccinated. Yet, despite that, it saw such a large outbreak of COVID, it had to shut down schools and restaurants. Epidemiological modeling results explain why. They showed that if vaccine effectiveness drops from 90% to even 60 or 70%, it would require nearly 100% of the population to be vaccinated in order to achieve herd immunity. In short, these countries that are last in line to receive vaccines are now stuck using a vaccine that is built for a form of the virus that no longer exists. Third, there is the possibility that continuing to vaccinate against the original form of the virus may cause increased harm to some individuals. The reason is called antibody-dependent enhancement, or ADE. When a pathogen enters the body, the immune system will develop antibodies against that pathogen within a few days. An antibody that can prevent entry to a cell is called a neutralizing antibody. Vaccines usually induce the creation of these neutralizing antibodies. However, if an antibody is similar enough to the invading virus to bind to it, but not able to neutralize it, these antibodies actually help the virus infiltrate cells and replicate faster. Historically, some vaccines have been abandoned because they caused ADE, including the recent dengue vaccine disaster. ADE is the same reason why getting infected with a second strain of dengue virus greatly increases your chances of severe hemorrhagic fever. The possibility that COVID vaccines could cause ADE was raised already in September 2020. The mechanisms of ADE have been observed in prior coronaviruses, SARS and MERS. Going forward, as SARS-CoV-2 continues to mutate, it may eventually reach the point of becoming a new strain. If that occurs and existing vaccines can only induce non-neutralizing antibodies, it is possible that ADE will occur, resulting in more severe illnesses rather than less. Putting it all together, we see that virus mutations may soon be outrunning the ability of vaccines to protect the population. With that in mind, many countries may have to rethink their strategy for vaccination and COVID in general. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out some of these other videos.